Finishing up with the respiratory system, it's time to talk about an incredibly important topic. In the third or fourth section of the class, I can never remember. I think it's the third. We are going to talk about acidosis and alkalosis. Um, those are extremely serious conditions. You're going to have a whole homework assignment um, in which I give you the um, parameters of a patient who is in either acidosis or alkalosis. And you're going to have to tell me whether or not it's being caused by the respiratory system or whether it's a metabolic cause and then whether the opposite system is compensating for that. So the respiratory system can either cause a problem with acid-base balance or it can help fix a problem with acid-base balance, all right? And it's important to realize that right from the start. It can be either the cause or it can be the solution. Now here, since we're covering the respiratory system, I'm going to talk about it mostly as being the cause. When we get to acid-base balance, I'll talk about it more as the fix, although I will mention that here as well. So respiratory acidosis means, um, do you remember, do you know your, um, your blood pH? You better. It's, the one, it's one of those numbers you had to know every single day from now until the day you die. So remember, your blood pH has to stay between 7.35 and 7.45. If you drop below 7.35, you're in a state of acidosis. If you go above 7.45, you're in a state of alkalosis. And now what we're going to see is that the respiratory system can be the cause of either of those to happen. So the pH of your cerebrospinal fluid is the most powerful respiratory stimulus. I mentioned this before. Um, remember that the blood, ultimately CSF is, comes from the blood, and the blood, then if the pH of the blood is either too low or too high, then the pH of the CSF will likewise be too low or too high. So your, your hypothalamus is monitoring the pH of the cerebrospinal fluid. Respiratory acidosis will occur when your pH drops below 7.35 as a result of something you're doing with your respiratory system. So it will be caused by a failure of pulmonary ventilation, for example, hypoventilation. Something I mentioned way back when we first talked about the carbonic acid stuff, I said always think of CO2 as an acid because that's the way it functions in your body. So think about what happens if you hypoventilate. Remember, what's the normal ventilation rate? 12 to 20 breaths per minute. So if you're hypoventilating, if you're breathing less than 12 times per minute, what's happening is you are not breathing out enough CO2. Therefore, CO2 is building up in your body. And since CO2 works like an acid, that will cause you to go into a state of acidosis. And because it's specifically caused by hypoventilation, we call that respiratory acidosis. Do you get it? Go back through and think about that again if you need to. So hypercapnia refers to too much um, carbon dioxide in the blood when the partial pressure of CO2 goes above 45 millimeters of mercury. So once again, CO2 is an acid. If you have too much CO2 in your blood, which would happen if you're not ventilating enough, if you're breathing less than 12 times per minute, you're not exhaling enough CO2, therefore CO2 builds up in your blood, so you will be in a state of hypercapnia, and all that CO2 will then cause the CSF to go below 7.35. CO2 easily causes, crosses the blood-brain barrier. All gases easily diffuse anywhere they want to. So in the CSF, the CO2 reacts with water, releases hydrogen, and that makes, as we saw, the bicarbonate ion plus the hydrogens. So how can you fix this? Well, you could fix it by hyperventilating. So if somebody has a state of respiratory acidosis caused by breathing less than 12 times per minute, just have them breathe more often. Of course, there could be other things causing it. For example, lung obstruction, if you've got COPD or something like that. So in that case, the fix might not be so easy but at least temporarily, your body will try to do that. So here's one of the signs that you'll often see. Whenever anyone is in a state of acidosis, no matter whether it's caused by the respiratory system or not, if the body is in a state of, of uh, acidosis, think about it. One of the ways that you could solve that problem is by getting CO2 out of the body because CO2 works like an acid. So what's a classic sign, symptom, sign, you know, I'm throwing those both together, of someone in a state of acidosis, they will be hyperventilating. Now, don't mix these up. Hypoventilation would cause acidosis, but if you're in a state of acidosis, then hyperventilation 
you'll try to fix it. So the classic person in a state of acidosis is trying to get rid of CO2, all right? So respiratory acidosis, specifically acidosis caused by the respiratory system. So in this case, hyperventilation, you're, we, what we say is you're blowing off CO2. If you hyperventilate, you will get rid of CO2. And here you see this choking game stuff that people do, choking other people out. What you're basically doing is um, you're uh, shutting off. It's not so much they don't get oxygen, it's that the CO2 all builds up. And so that can lead to a loss of consciousness. All right, let's look at the opposite, respiratory alkalosis. So now what we're looking at is a state of alkalosis that is caused by the respiratory system. So remember, what's alkalosis going to be? That's going to be a blood pH greater than 7.45. And if it's caused by the respiratory system, what would that mean? That means that they're hyperventilating. They're breathing more than 20 times per minute. So they're... <laughs> If you do that for a while, you will go into a state of alkalosis, all right? If you hyperventilate long enough, you will go into a state of respiratory alkalosis. So again, pH above 7.45 caused by excessive pulmonary ventilation, e.g. hyperventilation. Now you're in a state of hypocapnia. So your CO2 is less than, in this case, 35 millimeters of mercury. You don't have enough CO2 in your blood. That's why you are now alkalotic. You are in a state of alkalosis. And just as in the other case, how could you reverse it? By hypoventilating. That's one way. So slow the breathing down. Or maybe another way, so shallow breathing. All right, it's going to push that reaction to the right. Um, and um, that's, that would be one way to fix it. Another way, remember what's going to happen is if you hyperventilate, you're blowing off too much CO2. Well, what would happen if you put a paper bag over your paper just because it doesn't collapse? Plastic bags will collapse too easily. It's hard to inflate and deflate as well. So a paper bag, very easy. Breathe into a paper bag, and what's going to happen now? As you're hyperventilating into that paper bag, you're, you're exhaling too much CO2, but then you're breathing it right back in again. So that's always why somebody who's hyperventilating, well, always, a lot of the time, I'll say, it depends on the cause, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But a lot of the time, um, you can fix that by having the person breathe into a paper bag, and they'll breathe back in that CO2 that was causing their respiratory alkalosis. Now, pH imbalances can have metabolic causes as well. And so what will happen here is that the respiratory system, I already mentioned this before, let's just do it again. The respiratory system can be the cause of the problem, can be the cause of alkalosis acidosis, or the respiratory system can be the solution. So it's the solution for what? For what we call metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. In other words, this would be alkalosis acidosis caused by your physiology in some way, caused by something happening with your metabolism, caused by something else going on in your body, all right? So uncontrolled diabetes mellitus can cause metabolic acidosis. We'll talk about this later in the semester. People can go into what's called diabetic ketoacidosis. In diabetic ketoacidosis, it's because of the diabetes that they end up acidotic. They end up too much acid in their body. So guess what one of the classic signs, symptoms of a person in diabetic ketoacidosis is? They are hyperventilating like crazy. They are in a state in which it's actually their diabetes that's causing them to be acidotic, to have acidosis. But what their body is trying to do then is compensate, we call it compensation, with the respiratory system to get rid of that acid. So people, it's something called Kussmaul breathing. So people, this used to be the sign of somebody who was basically on death's door from diabetes type 1. Um, this would be... Um, you know, they were in a state of such severe acidosis that their body's frantically trying to get rid of all that CO2. So what are they doing? They're going, <sighs> <sighs> kind of like, you know, so you just like sprinted 400 yards or something like that. That's called Kussmaul breathing. That's the classic sign. There you see it in the video. This is a person in diabetic ketoacidosis doing Kussmaul breathing, frantically trying 
to get CO2 out of their body to solve the metabolic problem, all right? So what happens here is that in diabetes mellitus, especially type 1, you can't utilize glucose, all right? Therefore, your body oxidizes fast. We'll see this when we get to the nutrition metabolism part of the class. You end up with too many ketone bodies, which is what happens when you use um, when you oxidize fats incompletely, often happens when you're trying to use fats as your sole source of, of energy for ATP. You produce too many ketone bodies, and the buildup of ketone bodies causes what's called ketoacidosis. And again, the compensation in this case would be Kussmaul breathing or hyperventilation. Deep, rapid breathing. So take some time on this. We're going to have a whole section of the class on this later on. We're going to hit this again in greater detail, but now is the time to get to know it, to get used to the, to get comfortable with the respiratory side of all this. Later on, we'll get, try to go into more detail on the metabolic side of things. But I will quiz you on this. I will have this on your exam. I want you to have a full understanding of respiratory acidosis and alkalosis on both the causes and on what the solutions could be. Okay, so make sure to go over this a few times. I want you to know this. All right, so looking at other respiratory problems, hypoxia, literally high, hypo means not enough, oxia, oxygen, hypoxia means not enough oxygen in your body. So hypoxic, hypo, hypoxemic hypoxia, inadequate pulmonary gas exchange. So high altitudes, for example, if you go up way high in the mountains, especially up, you know, like above 20,000 feet, the, the actual percentage of oxygen is still the same but it's just the air is much thinner. The particles, the gas molecules are all spread apart. And so you can't breathe in enough oxygen at high altitudes. So you end up with hypoxia. This is why those people climbing Mount Everest, they usually wear oxygen tanks, okay? My brother climbed in the Himalayas, not quite that high. Mount Everest, 29,000 feet. My brother was only at 22,000. But he was saying that the hypoxia really got to them after a while. It makes you all goofy in the head and stuff. He said they would be like hiking and one of them like their shoes would come untied. And it ended up taking like four people to figure out how to retie their shoe. It messes with your brain. It makes you goofy in the head. So altitude sickness, high altitude hypoxemia is a big deal. All right. And then drowning, of course, you're not getting enough oxygen. Um, aspiration of fluid. All right. If you're breathing in fluid. Respiratory arrest. So if for some reasons your lung stops working, a degenerative lung disease, so if you've got chronic, you know, pulmonary diseases, and carbon monoxide poisoning. All of these would be uh, leading to hypoxia, not having enough oxygen. And of course, as you might guess, is hypoxia serious? Yeah. You can't live without oxygen. Remember, you can't live more than minutes without oxygen. You're going to die if you don't get oxygen. So that's why. The nursing school, airway, breathing, circulation, or even airway, airway, airway. So ischemic hypoxia, inadequate circulation. So if your blood, if blood is not getting to tissues, then remember the tissues of your body, like the tissues in your fingers, they're not directly getting oxygen from the atmosphere. They're getting oxygen from the blood. So look in the lower right, look what happens like to those people, again, who climb Everest. Um, what happens is in extreme cold, um, you get inadequate circulation, all right? And then you're, you get ischemic hypoxia, and in this case, the fingers are not getting enough oxygen. And what happens? The tissues die. You get necrosis, all right? And that person's... I think they say everybody who's climbed Mount Everest doesn't have all their fingers and all their toes. They've all lost at least a couple of fingers and toes. That's going to happen if you climb Everest. It's just so cold, you don't get adequate circulation. Anemic hypoxia, so anemia. So it could be, again, remember that you've got enough blood pumping through your body, but the blood's not carrying enough oxygen, like you've had an iron deficiency. Iron deficiency anemia, all right? Not enough oxygen going to your tissues, so hypoxia can come about through anemia as well. Histotoxic hypoxia, metabolic poisons like cyanide, will rob your ability to deliver oxygen to the tissues. What are going to be the signs? Well, cyanosis, blueness of the skin. So you see down there in the lower left, somebody with uh, um, cyanosis in the nails. Um, this is the kind of thing, we talked about this when we did the circulatory system. Like the baby's born with like, you know, tetralogy of fellow. You know, they have, you know, stenosis of the aorta or they have one of the, the holes in the heart or whatever. 
you know, newborn babies not getting enough oxygen to their tissues, their faces will start turning blue. And that's the time when people start sprinting down hallways and alarms go off. Because a baby whose face is turning blue is a baby who is in serious, serious trouble. Um, primary effect, tissue necrosis. Organs with high metabolic demands affected first. So who needs tons of oxygen? Yeah, like your heart, your brain. Uh, yeah, so, um, and then tissues dying, of course. But hypoxia, an extremely serious condition. If you're not getting enough oxygen, you're going to die. So you have to solve that problem immediately. Can you get too much, much oxygen? Yes, you can, all right? That's also a form of toxicity. So oxygen toxicity, pure oxygen breathed at 2.5 atmospheres or greater. So this is, remember, one atmosphere is the normal pressure at sea level. So high pressure oxygen actually is toxic and it can cause serious damage to the human body. Generates free radicals and hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. It starts destroying enzymes in your body damages the nervous system, can lead to seizures, death, coma, and so on, all right? And then hyperbaric oxygen. Um, so hyper, this is where they have the hyperbaric chamber. That's what you see on the lower left. Um, in certain cases, if people have hypoxia for various reasons, you can put them into a hyperbaric chamber, and that will give them more oxygen. Um, at one point, they did this with premature infants who were cyanotic, um, and then, unfortunately, they discovered that the hyperbaric oxygen was destroying their retinas. So you ended up with little babies who went blind um, from the hyperbaric oxygen. They were trying to do a good thing, and it ended up being a bad thing. So medicine can be very complicated. Look, a lot of medicine is just essentially trial and error. You just think of something, and you think, well, this should work, and then you try it. And sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. Or it only works under certain circumstances, so you have to be really careful. That's why doctors are so finicky about a lot of stuff. It's because, damn, you know, something that's good and too large of a dose or whatever could end up being very, very bad. So, all right. Yeah, antioxidant kicks out the free radicals. There you go. Doctor phone, superheroes of the circulatory system. So asthma, very, very common asthma. Lots of people have asthma. Um, this is where an allergen triggers histamine release. All right, so generally it's something that you breathe in, an allergen, pollen, dander, whatever, and that triggers the release of histamine. So remember, this is why it becomes so important. Now remember what histamine does? Histamine is a vasodilator, but a bronchoconstrictor. So histamine starts shutting down the bronchioles, all right? And once that happens, now it starts to get hard to breathe. People in an asthma attack are like, oh, oh, you can't. You can't breathe. It doesn't matter how much you're making your chest go in and out. It's the little bronchioles inside of your lungs that are all constricted down. So what do you do? Oh my God, remember that smooth muscle in your lungs that's constricting down? What do we need to fix that problem? By God, we need a beta-2 agonist. And that's what's found in those rescue inhalers. Albuterol, Ventolin, whatever. There's a bunch of different drugs. But that's what they're doing. You're basically just inhaling pure beta-2 agonist to try to bronchodilate and get to be able to breathe again, all right? So it's intense bronchoconstriction that blocks airflow. Symptoms include gasping, wheezing, tightness of the chest. Acute attacks treated with beta-2 agonists, okay? Long-term, they use steroids. Steroids, um, corticosteroids in particular, we'll, we'll learn about the corticosteroids coming up when we do the kidney. Um, the adrenal gland. Um, so corticosteroids coming from the cortex of the, um, of the um, adrenal medulla, um, of the adre adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex, oh my god. Um, so these steroids uh, work as anti-inflammatories, all right? These are the, the anti-inflammatory steroids. That These are for long term. These are not rescue. You'll see those ads on TV. These are not for an asthma attack or whatever, all right? This will not replace your rescue inhaler. You know, you've seen those kind of things. Steroids try to reduce inflammation systemically. So what they do is they try to prevent basically an asthma attack from happening in the first place. By, by being anti-inflammatory, they try to keep those bronchioles from ever shutting down. And then you won't need your rescue inhaler as often. And I think a lot of asthmatics now are on a combination therapy. Put them on long-term corticosteroids to try to reduce the number of asthma attacks. But then, of course, you still want them to have the rescue inhaler. If they have an emergency attack, they need that rescue inhaler. 
300 million people affected worldwide, 250,000 annual deaths. Asthma is serious. Asthma is life-threatening. If you can't breathe, you die. I mean, how many times have I said this, for God's sakes? So, never underestimate the seriousness of an asthma attack. Somebody who's having an asthma attack needs help now. They need help immediately. you got to find their rescue inhaler. you got to get somebody else's rescue inhaler. You need to do something. I mean, frankly, something like an EpiPen might work. I can't give you medical advice, but I'm saying... You need to do something to bronchodilate their lungs, or they might die. Caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors, some people seem more pre predisposed to it, and then also um, environmental things will trigger it. <clears throat> true or false, holding your breath will make your blood more acidic. Is that true or false? Holding your breath will make your blood more acidic. That's true, right? So remember, CO2 is like acid. So if you hold your breath, you're not breathing out the CO2, therefore you have too much CO2, you're hypercapnia, and that will lead to respiratory acidosis. Okay, so it's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Everybody knows this as COPD, sometimes referred to as breathlessness. People with COPD just get to a point where they're just struggling to breathe. They're just like, you know, they're working as hard as they can, and they just can't seem to get enough air into their lungs. They can't get enough oxygen. Um, so chronic bronchitis, all right, um, this is problems with the tubes, all right. <clears throat> so bronchitis, remember the bronchi are the tubes that go into your lungs. What can happen here, notice bronchitis, you've got inflammation and just gunk, mucus and all kinds of gunk in the bronchioles, and therefore bronchitis means your, your tubes are constricted, they're blocked, and you can't breathe. So bronchi chronic bronchitis is one type of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. <coughs> I got that Rona. Um, cilia immobilize and decrease in number. All right, so your body uh, loses its ability to compensate for that. So this is bad stuff. Um, goblet cells enlarge and produce excess mucus. There you see it in that lower left illustration um, and in the right one as well. Form a lot of sputum, spit. Mucus and cellular debris, you're always, you know, coughing up stuff, spitting stuff out. So it's an ideal growth medium for bacteria. Therefore, you get secondary infections here. Um, leads to chronic infection and bronchial inflammation. So this is very bad stuff. Um, COPD, not a happy condition. And by the way, what's the cause of virtually all cases of COPD? What was the original reason for that happening? Cigarette smoking. I mean, there are others as well, um, but still, don't smoke, kids. I mean, seriously, it just destroys your lungs. Just look at those old people with COPD. Oh, God. They say it feels like an elephant sitting on their chest all the time. They struggle to breathe. It's not fun. Cigarettes don't get you that high. I mean, you know, find something else. So, continue with COPD. Emphysema, another classic form of COPD. Um, this is a problem with the sacs. Remember, chronic bronchitis was a problem with the tubes. The tubes got clogged. Now emphysema is a problem with the sacs. So the alveolar walls break down, much less respiratory membrane for gas exchange. So even if these people are taking a big, full, deep breath, they don't have as much respiratory membrane, all right? And so they can't exchange as much gas. Lungs become fibrotic and less elastic. I was mentioning this before, the alveolar sacs get stiff, you lose compliance, so they can't collapse and expand easily, they're stiff, so they only collapse and expand a little tiny bit, you're hardly moving any air in and out, air passages collapse as well, obstruct the outflow of air, air ends up getting trapped in your lungs, um, this is not a happy situation, and again, most people, not all, but most people in emphysema got it from smoking cigarettes. Uh, so don't smoke, kids. Seriously, really. Um, and that lower illustration in the middle there, um, the funny thing, um, that's the L.A. basin. L.A. is a huge basin, all right? It's, it's a low-lying area, and it's ringed by mountains. And um, at one point, God, back like in the 1500s, L.A. was must have been like paradise. That would have been one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth. Now it's completely clogged with humans, and the smog, the air pollution is just unbelievable. I've been in L.A. a bunch of times. I live all up and down the California coast. I would never live in L.A. Just the constant daily smog in L.A. 
It was just, oh, good Lord. But it's kind of funny because it was the people in the low parts of the basin that were getting most of the particulate gunk in the air. Um, and so the wealthier people moved up into the hill regions like Pasadena and stuff, which is up higher so that they could get out of all the grime and the slime and the bus exhaust and all that kind of crap down below. But it's funny because what happens in areas like this, it happens in Tucson as well. You can see it some days driving from First Avenue down into downtown Tucson. You'll see like a layer of brown haze over the city. There's what's something called an inversion layer. It has to do with temperature and pressure. But basically what happens is all the particulate junk will get trapped at a certain layer and hover there. And as it turns out, a lot of the smog in L.A. got trapped and hovered right around the area like in Pasadena where all the rich people live. So all the rich people that moved up to the elite areas to get out of the gunk, they ended up being right at the inversion layer and you had people in those areas getting emphysema who had never smoked a cigarette in their life. It was just the daily smog of LA gave them emphysema. And uh, that's what you get for trying to be better than other people, you know what I'm saying? So effects of COPD um, decrease in vital capacity. Remember vital capacity? Breathe in as much as you can. <gasps> Blow it out forcefully. All right. So you don't, you can't hold as much air in your lungs. All right. COPD. You get hypoxemia, hypercapnia, respiratory acidosis. Classic cause of respiratory acidosis. You cannot get enough CO2 out of your body. All right. And likewise, you can't get enough oxygen in either. So, hypoxemia stimulates erythropoietin release, leads to polycythemia. So look what happens to these people. Their blood ends up too thick because their body is drastically trying to compensate for the fact that they're not moving enough air back and forth. So they give your body gives you more red blood cells. And of course, that ends up meaning you're more likely to for clots and all that kind of stuff. Um, core pulmonale, which is hypertrophy and potential failure of the right side of the heart due to obstruction of pulmonary circulation. So... Um, think about it. It's your right side of your heart that's moving air to your lungs, right, to get oxygenated. So one of the things that happens is if your body isn't getting sufficiently oxygenated, then basically your hypothalamus responds by thinking, I mean, your body, your hypothalamus, other compensatory mechanisms in your body will think, well, God, maybe the problem is that the right side of the heart is just not strong enough to get enough blood to the lungs, all right? So... The, the body then compensates by trying to make the right side of the heart bigger, thinking maybe that will solve the problem. Maybe if we have a bigger right side of the heart, we'll be able to get more oxygen. Of course, that's not going to work because that's not the source of the problem. It's not that the right side of the heart is too weak. It's that, you know, you've got clogged airways or, you know, sacs that don't work and stuff like that. But so you end up then with right side heart hypertrophy. Hypertrophy means too large. So people have an enlarged heart on the right side. That's called core pulmonale. And that's very bad because that ultimately ends up weakening the myocardium. And, oh God, kids, don't smoke. Seriously, COPD, just what a horrible, miserable thing to have, all right? I mean, you know, my, my sympathies go out to anybody that has it. I don't blame them. It's not like say, oh, it's your fault for smoking. No, it's not like that. Look, I've done plenty of dumb things in my life. And I smoked for a while. Um, so, you know, but God, yeah, don't don't let it happen to you. Don't let it happen. And yeah, smoking and lung cancer. Holy smoke. Holy smoke. Most common cause is smoking. 15 different carcinogens in cigarette smoke. Squamous cell carcinoma, the most common one. All right, remember squamous cells. Begins the transformation of bronchial, bronchial epithelium into stratified squamous epithelium, right? Dividing cells invade the bronchial wall, cause bleeding and lesions and so on. So there you see... On the right-hand side, you see what's going on here. The tumors invade the lungs, and of course, your ability to breathe gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse over time. And um, dense swirls of keratin replace functional respiratory tissue. So in other words, you lose functional cells, you replace them with keratin, like in your epidermis. So, oh God. And then you see on the left, there's a woman who had her lung removed. That's what it's going to look like. Look at that scar. Holy smoke. They go in from the back because it's a lot easier that way. But, uh, gosh, oh man, kids, don't smoke. So lung cancer, uh, adenocarcinoma originates in the mucous glands. Small cell oat carcinoma, least common, but it's the most dangerous. Originates primary bronchi, invades mediastinum, metastasizes quickly. So just other kinds. There are different kinds of lung cancer. All right, you know, so. 
And progression of lung cancer, 90% originate in primary bronchi. That's where it happens. Tumor invades bronchial wall, compresses airway, may cause atelectasis, so you'll have a dropped lung, a collapsed lung as a result of this. Often the first time is coughing up blood like poor Amy there. Oh gosh, that was so sad. She's such a great singer. She was coughing up blood before she died. Metastasis rapid usually occurs by the time of diagnosis. Usually by the time they diagnose this, it's too late. Common sites, pericardium, heart, bones, liver, lymph nodes, brain. That's where the cancer spreads to. So um, prognosis is poor after diagnosis. Only 7% of patients survive five years. Lung cancer is not a happy diagnosis. Um, look, at the, look at the graph there. A 20-year lag time between smoking and lung cancer. So look at that. Um, yeah, gosh. Gosh. That's uh, cigarette consumption, lung cancer. Yeah, look at that. Holy smoke. Mirrors it exactly. The most common cause, again, of lung cancer by far is smoking cigarettes. And there you go. Healthy lung on the left. There is a cancerous lung on the right. Um, at the Pima West Campus where you have a cadaver, this is a... We used to have a different cadaver. The family took that one back eventually. But in that cadaver, it was a woman, and she had been a smoker. And even in the cadaver... Her lungs had this, like, tarry goo on them. It's like, oh, my God. I used to love to let people look at that. I mean, we wore gloves and stuff, but you could look. You could see this black, tarry, goopy stuff that had oozed out of her lungs. Oh, my God, it was disgusting. Don't smoke!